good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gary Sealing, and I work as a software development at Element 84. This afternoon, I'm pleased to introduce Evan Oslik, a software security architect at First Vertex. He's going to talk about the goals of a software security program when we're doing lots of rapid deployment of microservices in an agile environment. Um, I'm really interested to see this. I'm interested in continuous integration and containerization, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has for us today. As always, uh, feel free to post questions in the Slack channel if you have them as the talk is going, and I'll moderate them at the end. And with that, take it away. Thank you, Gary. As Gary mentioned, my name is Evan Oslik. I am a software security architect at Vertex. Uh, we are, are located out of King of Prussia. A um, little history about me. I was a software engineer for about seven to 10 years, still dabble in software engineering on the side. I've been doing software security since about 2004. And as you can see from my welcome slide, I love the hello world examples. So the talk today is kind of recognizing how software development is speeding up and also recognizing that software engineers like to have as minimum friction as possible through the software development life cycle. And as we have gotten more acceptance and uh, more companies are working out of the agile methodology and leveraging containers, infrastructure as code, and even feature flags, uh, this stuff is not new per se, um, but the adoption rate has been giving, uh, been taken on at a higher rate recently. And as Scotty from Star Trek used to say, developers are giving their all that they got. Uh, when it comes to the agile world, you know, we used to do development in, for the most part, in the waterfall methodology, where you'd spend a significant amount of time up front dealing with requirements, gathering, spending time development, and then releasing these monster releases all at one time. So you had a lot of time to build in QA and security testing and all the other uh, extras that went along with development. From the Agile Manifesto, you see that you're working, you know, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with preference for the shorter time frame. All this is doing is making sure that we get smaller pieces of functionality out but it's also putting a lot of pressure from the security side in order to get testing to keep up with it. Uh, this poses a lot of challenges and we'll get more into a little bit of that later. When it comes to containers, um, Docker is basically being leveraged for an easier way of bringing on developers. As you can see, their whole goal is that it's easier to ramp up quickly and there's less busy work with Docker. And I remember when I was a software engineer, uh, back in the early 2000s, you know, we would sit there and have to deploy massive amounts of code over WebLogic app servers and manage the Sun OS boxes that they ran on. So there'd be a lot of uptime. Now I can spin up a Docker container running in a Kubernetes cluster in about a matter of minutes. Um, this has two benefits from the developer perspective. One, they don't have to sit there and play with the environment as much. The other is that I can port it to a different environment with very ease. And when a new developer comes on, they can just bring down the Docker file and do their updates and work with the code at, with that development structure as is. From a security side, it poses a lot of challenges. One, you have the security that goes with Docker. The other is that you have more people being brought in at a faster time scale. This means that more features get developed and more releases happen more frequently. Again, trying to play that catch up game and they're always chasing that rabbit. Uh, next thing that we look at is when we talk about infrastructure as code. Uh, again, they're trying to help the developers avoid inconsistency, help increase productivity and lower their costs. And again, similar to containerization, you're easy, it's easier to bring on a new developer at this rate. And when you can get more developers, you can get more features, more functionality and faster productive and more productivity. Again, you're scaling out the developer side at a much faster rate than the security side is going to keep up with. This raises a little bit of a challenge. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, even though there's a lot more that's being brought on, as Gary mentioned, you have CI, CD as well. But one of the more interesting things that's come up lately is the feature flags. You know, it's getting a huge adoption when you hear companies talk about A-B testing. Uh, you know, you're having systems that are basically changing on the fly. 
and you have users who are managing, uh, who have could be split up between different active features. Um, forget about roles and authorization controls. You also have one person may get a feature that doesn't exist in another user's profile. And this tends to lead to a lot of live code. Um, and when we talk about live code, we have a lot more of a surface area for a attacker to breach. Um, there's definitely a lot more functionality to test and it adds more stress to what a tester is gonna go through. And with that, uh, you know, there's other changes. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> this is the security way. No, you can't do that. I've said that pretty much from 2004 to 2008. Um, when I first started out in security, you know, I always thought that we were the gatekeepers. Um, the reality is security has to be somebody who's willing to work with the business and with the development community in order to help minimize the friction that the developers have. Um, that's kind of where this talk is going, is how we can help do that and how we can keep development working at speed. Uh, it's really working on securing a yes rather than enforcing a no. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the activities and that go on in a software security program, um, as well as kind of walk through how they mature. Uh, so there's a whole set of activities that need to be done. And, and they generally fall in four categories. Um, when we look at governance, we're talking about policies and audits. Uh, these are generally your policies of we are going to do secure code training, we're going to do static analysis, we're going to do all these array of processes. Um, and it's also, you know, working with what libraries we're going to use, uh, what libraries we're going to allow to be used, what licenses of libraries we're going to allow to be used and things like that. Uh, the next part is the audits. Uh, these are basically just kind of making sure that you're falling in line with what your policies are saying they're going to do. Uh, generally, you'll have people who are doing secure code training on some degree. A lot of times before you get that mature level, you're going off of, well, we've had this third party do a pen test or we've done a static code review. So our secure code training is, hey, here's where this vulnerability was found. Here's where it, you know, here's where the problem lies in the code base and here's how you would fix it. And they're more ad hoc style. And that's kind of where a lot of these are right at the beginning when you first start out, they're ad hoc, they're not a program level uh, setup. The next thing you kind of want to talk about is how you get people to think like a hacker. One of the biggest challenges that a security program has when it gets started is developers will challenge the security person saying, why would anyone do that? Um, and my best phrase that I can come up with for that is, don't worry about why, someone will. Uh, it could be done accidentally. It could be someone in the business who wants to just get their work done faster. Uh, and they feel that this is a way to do it. We've all know people who download software on their own machines to perform their business work faster. The same thing works at an app level. People will do what they can to get their work done. It does not have to be malicious. But even an accidental or non-malicious intent can have a really detrimental effect to the business. In the construction phase, this is kind of where you're talking about building the concept. We're looking at an architecture review. You know, there's two types of things that happen in most security programs at the beginning. You look at things like threat modeling. This is kind of taking a look at your overview, overhaul whole architecture and going, where are my communication gaps? Where are my connections between external systems? And where, what are the things that an attacker can do at that system? An example of this would be if I have a system that is calling a third party REST API, what are the gaps in that API? How do I authenticate to that API? How does that API send data back to me? Is it sending me data back in a JSON format? Or is it sending me data back in a straight string? And what kind of protections do I have to put in place on that data set for me to make sure that the, my own system is safe? Secure architecture, this kind of takes into two different areas when we look at it. It's first and foremost, how am I going to use architecture in, that is out there in a secure manner? What are my defaults that enable me to be secure? And the other part of secure architecture is consistency. When we talk about the verification stage, uh, this is where we're actually doing the testing. This is where we're looking at 
static analysis, doing reviews of code, uh, making sure that we're not using high risk uh, API calls. Uh, static analysis is usually considered more of a white box test because you have access to this, the source code itself. So you can analyze the source code, you can look at the design of the software and you can see what components are being used. And knowing what components are being used, you can definitely put recommendations forth for how to, what fixes can be put in. Uh, most of the time you'll see this done using automation. However, one of the things that is usually recommended is in your agile processes, when you have a story that is about to be closed, one of the things that you wanna make sure from an acceptance perspective is have you done a peer review on that code? Uh, the next one that we'll look at is dynamic analysis. Dynamic analysis is generally where you're looking at a code being, at a application being run. So this is where you have a deployed product that's being tested and it's usually considered black box or sometimes gray box if you have access to this, the source code. And sometimes when you have access to the source code, it makes it a little bit easier for the testing of the product to show where the vulnerabilities can actually be exploited. And that actually helps with prioritization. Um, dynamic analysis usually uses other tools that can either uh, analyze the binaries if you have access to the binaries, or it could be things like an HTTP proxy that intercepts requests and tools like that, which basically allow an attacker to inspect an element at a lot at a, a, a more detailed basis than a lot of people think you have access to when you're looking at just a web browser. Uh, there's two types of dynamic analysis of ta uh, tests that I like to talk about. Um, there's the vulnerability assessment. And the vulnerability assessment is really just a, let me get a wide area view of your, of your uh, product and see where I might be able to poke holes into. I'm not actively trying to get data out of it. I'm trying to get as much coverage at a width perspective than I am at a depth perspective. Contrary to that, you have the penetration test. This one is generally done at a way of here, I want you to go in and if I would say a bank, I wanted to say, I want you to go in and try to transfer funds from one account to another without me catching you. And I don't care how you do it. Um, good example of this, if you've ever seen the movie Sneakers, they were basically penetration testers who did various physical attacks, but also worked the systems as well. Um, but their goal was to actually get money out of the account, out of the bank that wasn't theirs. When you look at the operation side, uh, you're looking at logging and monitoring. Uh, these are basically where you've got to be careful what you're logging. Uh, obviously, you know you don't want to necessarily log somebody's social security number, uh, but you've also got to make sure that you're not logging an excessive amount. You don't want to necessarily have debug logs on in a production area where somebody's got to monitor that. Um, and monitoring is generally done using an automation type process. Uh, you know, they have sims, you have things like Logstash and Splunk that will help automate those processes. So at a high level, those are usually the types of functions that you'll see at a security program that is just getting started. Uh, they're generally run in an hot, ad hoc manner. There's generally no maturity to it. It's not necessarily automated. One group may be doing some of one group, some of one uh, aspect of it. Another group may be doing something else. So we kind of got to start looking at how do we organize these tasks and how do we start making sure that we're doing things in a manner that is consistent and how do we do it in a manner that produces results that shows our own product owners that our security posture is getting better within our own product. Uh, the one thing that I like to use, it's called the Software Assurance Maturity Model. It was developed by a uh, organization called OWASP, which is the Organization for Web Application Security. Uh, there is a chapter actually in the Philadelphia area, and there's some all over the country of the US and all over the world. Uh, they do have a very wide footprint. They were started about 20 years ago. And their whole goal, and you may have heard of the OWASP top 10, their whole goal is to help developers build more secure products. And they went out and they found a, based off of all the breaches and all the assessments that were done, the top 10 vulnerabilities at the time, and it's ever changing. But what they did was they came up with a maturity model to help organizations build out a program to help them more 
deploy a more secure software. And they basically cover out four different business functions. And again, as I kind of talked about before, I categorized it a little nicely. Um, you've got the governance, which is how does an organization manage the overall software development? Uh, this includes looking at things like metrics, education, government policies, and things like that. Construction is all about how do I build the basis for my product? What is my architecture? Do I have security requirements built in? Um, those types of activities. At the verification level, again, you're looking more at testing and consistency, building automation in, making sure that you have enough resources to do the testing. And as you build out that, those tests, focusing in on what's my remediation guidelines. Uh, when we look at deployment, we're looking at how am I securely deploying my product? Uh, we're looking at things like where am I storing my passwords for my environment, you know, for different environments? Uh, how am I managing change control and activities that center around that type of functionality? So now we're at the uh, main part of the talk, which is how can security keep up? You know, we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges and you know what a developer needs to do. And from a developer's perspective, when we looked at things like Agile, we were looking at things that delivered features in a much faster time. And it was also not just for features, but also for bugs. Um, from containers and infrastructure as code, we were kind of looking at things that help bring in more resources. It was elements that enabled a resource to get up to speed and be able to de develop at a much faster clip. These types of things really were meant to get developers up and running more and allow more features to be developed at a quicker rate. When you looked at things like feature flags, we're looking at the ability to switch on and off different feature sets or the ability to even roll back something that has failed. You know, there's, there's a possibility that a user, that a group is doing A-B testing and they find that a feature isn't getting as much traction as they thought it would. So they shut off the feature and then they roll it back to let redirect everybody to the other side. From the security side, you know, when we look at things that were challenging, you know, security is a depth based system. You need to be able to understand the details of how all these frameworks interact with each other. You need to be able to understand how the communication is going between different components. And when you look at especially something like a microservice driven architecture, you could have many hundreds and hundreds of Microsoft services that are being talked to. And the security side has to understand the relationship between those. It's generalized a specialized skill uh, in terms of there's not many people who do it. Uh, it's not a glamorous job as much as some of the movies make it. Um, there's a lot of tedious work that goes into it. Uh, you know, you've got to just sit there and play around with different values. You can have developers who use tools like a fuzzer. Um, a fuzzer is something that basically just sends random data at a field. Uh, and it's a lot of watching and tweaking and just kind of experience helps get you to a point where you kind of see, oh, okay, I see this is where a hole could potentially be. Uh, and then when we look at feature flags and other things, we're looking at m more threats, more surface area. Uh, as, as you have a more complex code base, you're going to wind up in a situation where defects could be lying around that enable a developer or enable an attacker to breach a system. Um, I can tell you working f as a software engineer, there are products that I built that are still out there uh, and I'm, don't even want to think about what may be out there as a result of these old systems that are out there running. But they're, you know, every system that comes up new has to work with an existing legacy system. So how do we improve the performance of a security program? The first part is documentation and communication. Uh, you, I'm assuming at this point, I should caveat this, I'm assuming at this point, you know, you've got upper management buy-in. Um, without the upper management buying into the program, uh, you're pretty much struggling uphill uh, with a boulder. Um, it really is a necessity and it is really something that without you can pretty much 
being sure that this program is going to fail. Once you have that, then you've got to start documenting and communicating. One of the first things that I do when I go into a company is I meet with the program managers. I explain to them what's going on uh, in terms of what our goals are, how we will start. My preference is generally starting with static analysis, uh, just because I came from a software engineering world and I'm more comfortable with it. And it gives me more of an insight into the architecture of the products that are being developed. Um, then I'll explain to them, you know, what the next steps are, where we're looking to go to and what we need uh, from them in order to make this program work. I will ask them also to get, get, tell me what their development life cycle looks like. Without that, I can't help them as much. The thing that I don't wanna do is put friction on them and the developers. The next thing that we'll do is I generally, like I said, run a static analysis pro, uh, scan first, but we can also, we'll also run a dynamic scan. And then I will go through and get rid of the false positives first. Before I ask them to do any remediation, before I ask them to do any automation, the first thing I want to do is get rid of all the false positives because assuming this is assuming that a product has been around for a while, there could be hundreds and hundreds of bugs that are out there. And if you start feeding developers, these issues, they're going to be spinning their wheels, they're going to lose faith in the program, and they're going to lose faith in the tool set, and they're going to get frustrated and just not want to do it. So the biggest thing that I can do is help them be successful, is use my experience and help get rid of the false positives. Um, and from a static analysis perspective, that is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, it doesn't have context of what else is around to protect the application, so it tends to be a little noisy. Whereas dynamic analysis, you tend to not get as much visibility into the application because you may or may not be hitting code flows. Uh, after you've done the getting rid of false positives, the next thing you want to do is automate your scans. Uh, this will help get a process going and get you used to, hey, we've got to check the results from the static scan. We've got to check results from the dynamic scan. Let's start doing that. I do not at this point start feeding in those bugs to any defect tracking system or bug tracking system, uh, mainly because I, as stated next, I want the team to demonstrate that they are doing remediation. If I've got defects that are sitting out there from a static analysis engine for six months, a year, whatever the case may be, it makes no sense for me to feed those into a uh, bug tracking system. It just, it'll just sit there. Uh, it also means that I'm not going to wind up bringing in more tools and more tooling because again, all I'm doing is adding more to the backlog and growing the depth and the technical debt. Uh, after we've seen some remediation done, then we'll start looking at automating the feeds to the bug tracking system. Um, generally, when you start looking at Agile, because you're going with smaller features and smaller sets of code going out, your automatic feed should be very limited in terms of the number of issues that are found. And that will help keep the confidence level in the tools up with the development community. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is kind of solving for the skill gap in security. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there's very few people who do security compared to the number of developers. Um, Generally, what you'll see companies do is they'll bring in additional security testers, they'll hire people. Um, generally, you want to get somebody who's used to be a developer um, if you're looking at application security, but you can get pretty much anybody who has any scripting experience. Uh, it's just making the team a little larger. The next area that we see is we like to talk about security champions. You know, I, I would want to call them security slaves, but that tends to go over pretty poorly. Um, these are basically people who are on the program to the agile teams. They are the ones who are focused with pushing security forward within their group. Um, they generally work with the application security team and they help look at the defects coming out of the different tools. And they can also get trained up in how to do security testing. Um, generally, the people who make really good security champions are the ones who have an interest in security, and they also have experience on the team. That said, I'd rather have somebody who's more junior that has an interest in security than somebody who's senior who doesn't. Um, 
next, you know, I'll look at bringing in third parties. A lot of times, uh, depending on what your product is, you may need to have a third party come in and do your assessment anyway, if you have to meet some certifications. Um, if you have to be HIPAA compliant, a lot of times they'll require a third party to do a scan anyway. Uh, so you'll have to bring them in. Another option is bug bounties. Uh, bug bounties are really a good thing. Um, I will admit that at first I was kind of hesitant, um, but one of the things that bug bounties offers is that you're only paying for bugs that are found. Uh, from a product perspective and a company perspective, this has a huge benefit in that I'm not necessarily paying for a scan that is gonna just get me those low hanging fruit. They wanna actually find and have incentives to find some of the deeper vulnerabilities that could potentially cause more harm. Uh, again, and one of the other ways that you can help solve this skills get gap is automation. Uh, one of the things that I look to do is integrate my tests that I do from a manual perspective into the uh, normal integration and unit tests that are going on in the development process. Get those automated. Uh, it alleviates the load. If you teach the people who are writing unit tests how to do security tests, they can build them in from the beginning and it will alleviate a lot of stress on the security team. And lastly, one of the, again, one of the more important aspects for helping resolve the skills gap is remediation. Uh, generally, remediation really can't be just thought of as fixing one issue. It's looking at classes of issues and understanding at a development and architecture team way, how does this remediate this class of vulnerabilities so that we don't duplicate it again? So kind of looking at remediation with a combination of education. The last area that we got to look at is dealing with increased surface area. Um, this is again is where you usually have a threat modeling or you're bringing up more microservices and it's kind of a, the app is growing. So as the app grows, how do I deal with that from a security team? Uh, the first way is with threat modeling. Uh, I need to understand where my threats are as that feature gets put in there. I need to understand what does it interface with from an AWS perspective, for instance, am I using Lambda? Uh, am I using you know, an, an, uh, an S3 bucket? What's my S3 bucket security controls? Uh, am I integrating with a third party service that does credit card processing? How am I saving the data? How am I storing data? Those are the types of things that we talk about from a threat modeling perspective. Uh, the second is again, integrating security tests with functional automated tests. As I've found, you know, some security issues come up, I want to work with the development teams and the QA teams, depending on how they're set up. I want to work with those teams and I want to build out tests that will evaluate those issues and see where they're, you know, see if we can repeat them in other areas. Uh, one of the biggest things here is dealing with authorization controls. You know, for a security person to really test out all the authentication issues and authorization issues that can occur is a lot of work. I don't always know the roles that are out there in the system. For a developer, I can work with the developer to understand what those feed, what the tests would look like, and we can start working on building them out so that they go across across the entire system. And lastly, security champions. I, I really cannot stress this enough. If if you can't get somebody who's on the teams to help out and who knows the product and who knows the area, it's going to be a much larger struggle to actually make sure that the product is getting the security testing that it needs to do. And with that, I thank you for attending the talk. I, one of the things that I liked about the virtual stuff is I didn't have to worry about people commuting um, and not showing up or walking out. Um, Gary, uh, I guess thanks again, and I'll look for any questions or concerns. All right, sure. So there's a bunch of good questions in Slack. Thanks, Evan, for, for doing this. Um, so the first question, can you list some static analysis tools that you use? Uh, so I will hesitate to recommend any, but there are tools like Fortify, Checkmarks uh, are two of the bigger ones that are out there. Uh, White Hat does some static analysis as well. Okay, cool. Do any of those tools feed into, automatically feed into bug tracking systems or do you do that manually? So initially I would recommend doing it manually uh, after you've gone through the false positives. After you have done that, 
most of the larger enterprise level tools do have feeds into JIRA. Uh, most of them do have also, excuse me, have uh, either a REST API or some other SOAP API type of call that will allow you to pull data out of them and feed, do whatever you want with them. Um, there are also tools like ThreadFix and Defect Dojo um, from OWASP, which help actually correlate data between the different uh, tool sets out there. Okay. Can you give an example of a uh, false positive you've seen from one of these tools? So I'll give uh, a couple. So static analysis, um, as I said, is very noisy. And one of the my favorite ones to talk about with that is it likes to claim that anything that has the word password or the regex PSSWD or something like that is a hard coded password. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a variable name or a comment, it sees that regular expression and it flags it. 99% uh, of the time, that's a false positive. Uh, it could be somebody naming a field in an object as the password, um, but not actually having a value assigned to it. Um, that's one example. Uh, from a dynamic side, you don't get as many false positives, but a lot of times what you'll see there is the test is occurring in an environment that doesn't mimic uh, production. Uh, so you'll see cases where they're running it without SSL turned on um, solely because that's where they're doing the test. Um, most places, I kind of mentioned that, most places when they run dynamically, um, you don't want to run it in a production environment until you're sure that it's not doing any dangerous tests. Um, I tend to run them in a staging environment, which is production-like, uh, but you can still get areas where they're still not even configured as tightly as production. So you'll get some false positives that way. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so this question I think is about uh, the slide where you had the, uh, examples of how to sell people on the security program just the performance of security program. Mm -hmm. uh, would it make sense to demonstrate that you can find and remediate an issue prior to enforcing scans um, rather than doing the build pipeline stuff first? Yes, that is actually a great, uh, great point. You definitely want to run it in parallel to your CI CD pipeline until you get the remediation showing. Uh, I've had companies where that takes a long time. I've had times where it comes up short, you know, comes up very quickly and they're rarely on it. You don't have to wait until there's, you know, a hundred percent coverage on it uh, or a set point. Um, most of the tooling you can configure so that the, uh, you can configure so that you get alerted or you can stop builds at a certain criticality level. For instance, if I found a critical vulnerability, I could just stop the build. Um, but you also can set it up so that if I have 100 mediums, uh, depending on where you are in your state, um, I definitely would run it in parallel before I would run it uh, integrated with your CI CD pipeline. Sure, that makes sense. So when you're doing security work with people, do you see um, evidence is there a way for you to see as a security person the evidence that you're doing good work like less number of times your site gets hacked or something or are you way down in the weeds on the stuff so that's a great question uh it's it's the things that i look for um i'm more of a systems guy than a goal guy is i want to see the number of findings from the tooling go down um and I want to ensure that the developers aren't making the same mistakes multiple times. Uh, there's a saying, you know, that's out there that it's not, if you get hacked, it's when. Mm -hmm. um, and my goal is to make that when a lot further out. I know that it's highly likely that it's going to happen. Um, I just want to make sure they're not doing it with some easy type of test. Uh, and, you know, that could be because I'm, not an interesting target. It could be I've done good security. Um, the best way that I can know that I'm doing things right is that the number of findings that I have in my uh, assurance program are going down. Sure. So uh, another question, when you're dealing with third party security reviews, how do you deal with security and technology gaps with the security team personnel? The security review seems to be only as good as the reviewer. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I understand which direction that that's going to. Um, if you're referring to a customer asking the rep or you're referring to like security questionnaires. Um, 
That's a good question. This sounds like this is a question about having essentially a code review done by a security person who's external. Okay, so if you have a, so when you start looking at external reviews, um, generally a good third party company will walk through with you to understand the app and understand where the high value areas are. Um, you generally can get ones who just kind of blindly do the tests and usually what'll happen is they'll do the test and then you have a period of review uh, with the test and you can have the discussion over whether or not it's a real finding or not. Um, I tend to like to, uh, because I'm a security guy, I like to push the any third parties hard on anything that I find questionable. And the other side of that equation is that if you think that there is a uh, potential issue and you want to really test the company that did the party, did the test, um, ask them about that issue after the test and see what their thoughts are, if they tested it or if they don't think it's an issue. Um, I've had that happen in a couple of cases. Sure. Um, another question, have you worked with Sonar for static analysis? And if so, how does it compare to Fortify? So I used Sonar a long time ago for it. Um, at that point, it wasn't very strong in it. I've heard good things about it, but again, it's not its specialty. Uh, and I also will save my comments on Fortify. <laughs> okay. Um, so another question. So for someone who would con be considered a security champion uh, on a SaaS product, how can I best work with central security teams, some of which don't have previous development or ops experience to understand, to better understand the challenges we face so we can work cooperatively instead of in a us versus them mode? I think one of the first steps that anybody in security can do when working with an external group is, is try to understand what their workflow is. If you can understand what their workflow is and what their challenges are, it's a lot easier to fit what needs to be done into that. That includes, even if they need to make tweaks, you can make the tweaks in a manner that works best with them rather than trying to force it onto them. Uh, I've worked with groups that do agile. I work with groups that do waterfall. Um, and really it ultimately comes down to being empathetic and having that open communication with them and understanding where their challenges lie within their workflow. and if it means that you have to write a couple of scripts to help them out to expedite the results that they're looking for, to do some work that they, you may think they're doing, even if you do it initially, it'll save a bunch of pain later on. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, can you talk about security concerns that are specific to mobile development as opposed to like back regular backend development? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So when you look at, Mobile, it's again, the, the surface area question comes into mind. Uh, mobile, the device itself is, you know, can be left somewhere. So your threat model is completely different mm -hmm. than if I'm on a backend server or if I'm on a laptop even. Um, laptop's really kind of similar, but not exactly. Um, with mobile, when you look at things like two-factor authentication, usually your two-factor either app or SMS is part of the device. So you've got a little bit of more challenge there. Uh, so you've got to really think about the model of where the app is living uh, as far as where security is. Otherwise, you've got a lot of similarities with network controls, how am I storing data, you know, how is data being transferred. Um, with mobile, you have a little bit more in terms of interaction between potentially the system and the app itself, like the camera and things like that. All right, cool. All right, I think that's, that's all the questions. Uh, thanks so much for joining this talk. Um, Thank you. I hope everyone has a great day and everyone's staying safe.